Beyond anthropocentrism, music and sound is acts of care between humans and other animals. In this paper, I explore human and non-human musicalities as means of challenging the hierarchical organization of life embedded within a capitalistic and anthropocentric society. Thinking alongside Mariana Ricci, I explore the detrimental effects of the celebration of a specific individualistic autonomy that asks us to disregard the acts of caring for others and the planet. Instead, in, in the dialogue with Jim Sykes, I propose a frame that engages with music as an act of sonic generosity that breaches hierarchies of value between humans and non-humans. Ultimately, I suggest that critically engaging with the study of non-human musicalities empowers the critique of cultural imperialism and anthropocentrism. Deep in the sea where no light reaches and sight loses its purpose, sound reigns the underworld. Humpback whales, dolphins, and other marine mammals exchange symphonies of sounds that change over time and fill the ocean with meaning beyond human consciousness. <laughs> Sung by whales, perpetual and infinite soundscapes are organized accordingly to predictable structures that last usually between five and 30 minutes, but averaging 15 that are repeated over and over in sessions that last several hours at a time. A way of recording the Caribbean, for example, sang for 22 hours straight, breathing only between musical phrases and was still singing strong when the researcher went back home exhausted. Not only do whales sing in groups, but more extraordinarily, their songs shift over time simultaneously with whales from the other side of the world, leaving humans utterly baffled by their deep, beyond 3,000 miles unspeakable connection. The changes in songs are not only happening often in an approximately two months frequency, but the entirety of the whale population is up to date with the newest trend. Whereas these songs were initially incorrectly attributed to mating calls, as they are most often sung by males, upon further study, it becomes quickly clear that humans simply have no idea what their purpose is. If Hunpack's whales are pseudo Wagnerians with their infinite unfolding themes and never ending performances, Dolphin's sound production is more like American modern experimentalism, with some exceptions. With their clicking sounds, whistles, and squeaks, these animals conduct most of their communication at frequency way beyond human acoustic range. Yet humans have successfully been able to partially understand their modus operandi by analyzing the relationship between their sound production and societal organization. For example, clicking noises are used especially for echolocation and navigation. Yelps express curtain activities and squeaks are yelled when in danger. More romantic are the sounds similar to the noise that a finger rubbing against a balloon makes, which are produced by dolphins touching each other when in pleasurable company. Dolphins are also known to sing long, quote, long beautiful songs to bond with their babies, end of quote, when still in their womb, as well as after their baby's birth. Scientific studies have shown that dolphins sing signature calls to their young two weeks before birth and several weeks after, or until the young dolphin develops their own signature call used very similar to human names. Apparently, spindle neurons control these activities and are, are also responsible for the capacity of experiencing deep emotion. These neurons, which humans have only a third of, are associated with a variety of skill, such as being able to recognize others, memorizing information and sound, reasoning, communicating, adapting to change, and solving problems. Meanwhile, high in the skies, populating the tall trees of Southeast Asia, a relatively small species of monkey, the gibbons, fill the forest at the break of dawn with their mating calls. are sung only when two gibbons recognize each other as mates and are then sung for the rest of their lives together. 
that are not only precisely timed in specific and rigid patterns, but are also always exclusive to the pair and are a combination of short phrases that become more complex over time. The fact that we humans might dislike these calls and perceive them very distinctly as non-romantic is related to our sensor, sensory system not being the same as the gibbons. David Teye, who is a cellist, cellist uh, and instructor at Maryland University, has successfully demonstrated that music appeal is intrinsically related to each species' respiratory rate, heartbeat, and even the breathing rate of fetuses in the womb. Teye has been dedicated now for several years to the study of tamarind monkeys' vocal range, as well as their physiology, in an attempt to write music for them. He has successfully composed two contrasting pieces, an exciting one and a lullaby that were gratefully appreciated by the tamarinds. The results were expe as expected. Not only did the monkeys pay attention to the music and obviously listen, but they also had different reactions based on the mood of the piece. When exposed to the exciting one, their energy heightened and their behavior was more erratic. Whereas the lullaby calmed them down and sent them into a state of tranquility. What made the music appealing to Tamarin? And what intrinsic characteristic made its pieces specific? Tay explains that human sensibility is met when the musical pattern shift every 10 or 30 seconds. Since animals such as the mandarins process sound 10 times faster, their liking is a much quicker shift, one to three seconds. This observation explains why animals don't necessarily resonate with human sound production and vice versa, and has a potentially larger significance in animal communication and humans' ability to tune into their species-specific temporality and modes of sound production. The establishment and justification of cyclical systems of oppression. The dispute concerning non-human musicality is still widely characterized by a binary debate. Some argue that animal music stems from the need to sexually reproduce for the special survivors. Others argue that there is no purpose in music and that is simply an incident of the nervous system. Both theories are limited by the notion of scholars' own intellectual superiority and the logocentric approach to study typical of Eurocentric Western mentality. The supposed theories echo the long-standing Western assumption of human exceptionalism based on cognitive traits that are exclusive to verbal language. Miriam Pilonen challenges some of these ideology, examining the role that Darwin had within the musical debate. She shows that whereas Darwin believed that music is universal, he perceived as musical only those sounds produce productions that fit within the formal constraints dictated by, quote, Western pitch and rhythmic structure, end of quote. In this way, whereas his notion included bird songs as music, it excluded percussive African traditions and many other sound landscapes that did not fit or music that did not fit his Western ear parameters. This idea can be extended to the resistance of Western European cultures to ascribing to non-humans, until quite recently, women, BIPOC, and other ostracized humans, the ability to produce music. Whereas here I don't aim to argue that any creature is able to compose music, I want to point out that formal ideologies of music framed through Western culture have prevented and continue to prevent the important recognition of non-human intelligence and aesthetic production. Following, I trace a brief history of the establishment of early capitalism, a story of violence and cultural imperialism, which erased animism as part of its project of desacralizing life and dehumanizing people, women, and any non-European, while at the same time theorizing workers and non-human animals as machines in service of profit and production. In Caliban and the Witch, Silvia Federici analyzes how animism stood in direct opposition to the establishment of early capitalism. She specifically discusses the role that the new means of wealth accumulation had in erasing specific cultural norms that impended a capitalist organization of labor, such as breaking up the day into waged hours and placing ownership of the means of production into the hands of the few. Federici shows how in order for capitalism to be established, the medieval understanding of life as spiritual, magical, and animist needed to be erased. 
Animism was in medieval times a leading European belief system and was and still is shared among many cultures around the world. Animists conceptualize the body as sacred and perceive every living organism, including plants, animals, rivers, trees, and so forth, as embodying a spiritual presence. People are seen as part of nature rather than superior and separated and therefore integrated within a larger system of life, which includes animals, plants, landscapes, planets, and cosmic energies. Shamans, healers, and witches were the witchers, the knowers of the spiritual and animal words, and the practitioners of interspecies communication, both of which gave them a revered, revered role in the community. They also were the keepers of time, observing the turning of the season, the shifts in the stars, and the interpreters of complex calendar, calendars present, present in every single human culture. Moreover, the task and service extended to the healing of illness and the control of pregnancies. This last of all their gifts was the most detrimental to their survival. As a capitalist battle against reproductive autonomy was, and still is, one of the most savagely fought in history. healing through song, Icaros, and the spiritual world. Diametrically opposite to the silencing capitalist enterprise, shamanic and other non-Western healing practices of sounding, chanting, drumming, listening, and dancing keep sacred and often secret tradition alive. For example, shamanism as practiced in the Amazon is intrinsically rooted in learning in the learning of songs taught directly by plants, animals, and natural elements. For a lot lifelong training of deep listening, ceremonial practices, fasting rituals, and the usage of plant medicine, healers learn to use song, sound songs and rhythm to help people remember and retain their original state of health. Music as a spiritual practice is also shared among many cultures and religion around the world, such as Hinduism, Sufism, Buddhism, Paganism, etc. Pertaining to all these cultures is the idea that transcendental states can be obtained through music and that sounds are bridges between the rational and the magical, between the eros and the logos, and between humans and unhumans. Whether it is the transmission of a spiritual idea or an emotion, or a space in which something internally clicks and is reestablished in its wholeness, I would argue that music making remains one of the most mysterious activities we engage in. Individual autonomy and resistance through music. Putting in dialogue the works of Jim Sykes and Mariana Ricci and thinking alongside them, I explore alternative relationships and conceptualization of music and sound, not as something driven by profit and a capitalistic modus vivendi, but rather as necessary practices for the well being of communities and the individual. Rooted in values that prescind profit and commodification, soundscapes and musical production bring forth through being a critique of the status quo. In the musical gift, for example, Sykes explains that what characterized Sri Lankan music activity as dramatically different from the Euro Western world is that music is foremost exchanged freely as a gift. Sykes argues that sonic generosity is fundamentally an act of care offered to protect people and connect with others, to human, non-human, the gods, and not only results in care for others, but for oneself. The system Sykes analyzes is what he calls, quote, the musical gift, end of quote, which is a firmly held belief that music is fundamental to our existence because it fulfills an intrinsic need that the community has, much like having food or medicine. Music and sounding landscapes exist then within and outside capitalism, building bridges between different ways of perceiving music, its functions and purpose. For example, in contemporary US, music must appeal to large numbers of people or to establish philanthropic institutions in order to make it and have a specific purpose or importance attributed to it. When music is not consumed according to capitalistic logic, it loses not only its monetary value, but its usefulness and reason for existence. This speaks to Mariana Ricci's engagement with the idea of artistic autonomy in contrast to neoliberalist conceptualization of art. She shows how art is described as useful rather than necessary when it, uh, quote, creates jobs, trains workers, produces tax revenue, or help make America look good, end of quote, in its international enterprises. 
This means that music is labeled as useful only when commodified and when producing revenue. And conversely, is labeled as useless when it doesn't appeal to large numbers of consumers or to institutions. The, concept, the conceptualization of life under capitalism as a competitive practice in which the individual's detachment from others is the means by which self-sufficiency and self-care is obtained is a sickly way of perceiving life. Yet it is arguably necessary in the free market and it affects musical production deeply. Under neoliberalism, not only do individuals attribute their success almost exclusively to their own effort and hard work, refusing to recognize the immense support they receive from their larger community, but despite those that are less well established, despise those that are well established, that despise those that are less well established and cannot care for themselves. The specific celebration of individual autonomy as related to choice more than gender, race, class, ableness, and overall social societal position, which she explains, leads to a hierarchical perception of value that puts at the bottom thus not being able to take for themselves and blames their position on them for their lack of energy, talent, or a good work ethic. In a multitude of ways, the act of caring for others and perceiving oneself as intrinsically connected with others becomes detrimental to individuals struggling to survive in the free market system, where competition and the survival of the fittest are framed as inevitable ways of being human. Is it true that competition and opportunism are innate? And are those the attitudes that we want to nourish throughout our lives? It appears that whereas these qualities are very valid within a neoliberal system, which forces musicians to struggle to underpaid gigs and attempt to create their own path as entrepreneurs, what still remains a major component of making music is empathy, deep listening, sensibility, intimacy, and care. In conclusion, I have been researching non-human musicalities as means of pointing at systems of values that oppress musical production in an anthropocentric and capitalist society to move towards a more ecocentric perception of music and soundscapes. Instead, by opening to the interconnectedness of ourselves with everything around us, a reorganization of life might become possible, one that perceives others as intelligent beings and recognize the gift that they share with us and among each other. Thank you. <laughs>